Good evening. Uh, I'm Brian Butler from the Philosophy Department. Uh, happy to welcome you to the seventh annual uh, Door Lecture on Art and Aesthetics. This is the seventh annual Door Lecture. Joyce and Larry Door envisioned a, an annual lecture that would help bring a deeper understanding of the creative process to the UNC Asheville campus. But with this in mind, they created an endowment uh, that the campus uses to bring a distinguished speaker on the nature of the creative process and the meaning of art in the contemporary world. While the endowment is the central catalyst for this event, this year's lecture would not have been possible without a further generous gift from Jim Topp and Paula Griot. I would also like to thank the generosity of other Asheville and on-campus organizations. These include the Media Arts Project, the Haywood Park Hotel, UNCA's Cultural and Special Events, Multicultural Affairs, University Programs, Humanities, the Multimedia Arts Council, and the Departments of Multimedia Arts and Sciences, Philosophy, Music, and Arts and Ideas. This is truly a city and campus-wide event. This year, we are honored to have as our door lecturer a world-renowned composer, writer, conceptual artist, and theorist. Paul Miller, also known as DJ Spooky, that subliminal kid. I see him as a particularly appropriate lecturer for the area. His work clearly relates to such honored locals as Charles Olson, Robert Moog, John Cage, and Robert Rauschenberg. Further, the Emersonian tones found in his work exemplified, exemplify a profound picture of the creative process, one with wide-ranging implications in such areas as originality, identity, and copyright law. Without further ado, Paul Miller. Hey, what's up, everybody? How you doing? Hello, hello. Um, first and foremost, I just want to say um, thanks to the philosophy department for bringing me. And, um, you know, I had no idea so many people were into philosophy. Eh? Um, but you guys, it's a beautiful day, and I just want to say thanks for coming out. I know everybody's got their hectic schedules, and you guys are all very busy with school and everything, and I'm chilling out. So, um, you know, I just wanted to like, say thank you. So um, tonight, I'm going to do a little bit of a uh, kind of a riff on my book, Rhythm Science, that came out on MIT Press a little while ago. And the book is basically kind of exploring how this hip hop, techno, drum and bass generation, all these styles of electronic music uh, have become part of the basic vocabulary of how we think about information. And that's a key word for me. Um, as an artist, writer, and musician, I like to think of music not as music, but as information. It's not really about just press and play and just everybody you know, has a good time, although that is, of course, why we DJ. But at the same time, you have to imagine that people have grown up, you know, I was born in the, the late, uh, you know, ancient 70s, you know, uh, the late 20th century, you know, and I grew up with uh, satellites. And you guys, uh, when I was on campus in the ancient early 90s, mid-90s, you know, uh, we barely had wireless networks. And now, of course, all of that has come home to roost as the basic, you know, just, you just turn on your computer and you kind of expect it like you expect good coffee, you know. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is unpack some of the issues from my book. And the idea here is that we're looking at how do you make art out of patterns of culture. And that's not necessarily about painting or sculpture or if, even, for that matter, a philosophy of rhythm because hip-hop and drum and bass, techno, ambient, all these styles are merely surface reflections of what I like to think of as a deeper phenomenon of urban youth culture's relationship to digital culture. So what I'm going to do is kind of unpack that. The book's called Rhythm Science, and I'm going to kind of walk you guys through some of the issues that it's by me. So, with that said and done, behind me you have um, one of my favorite films. It's called Style Wars. And these are tags that were put on the trains in New York in the late 70s. And you can see everybody had a specific vocabulary. They were able to, you know, what they call bomb the system very quickly. You had to be able to get your tag up on the train, get your style out. And the goal of these kids, these were young kids, you know, 15, 13, 17. Um, the goal was to become what they call all city. And what was so beautiful about the graffiti movement, aside from Mayor Cod sicking dogs on kids and 
police chasing everybody down near the railroad tracks to get away from it all, there's a strange uh, kind of quality because the city spent over, you know, something like hundred million dollars plus to get kids to not put their identity on the trains. So what you're seeing here is a battle. This, these train logos are a battle between public space and private expression. Each of those kids worked for days, sometimes weeks, sometimes months to get that tag ready, you know, so they would be able to get it up on the train really quick and get out before the police or the dogs or whoever attacked them. So you have to imagine that these are meant to be something that's done quickly and elegantly and then they're out. So that these kind of tags are such a kind of a testimony of people's passion for expression. So the graffiti movement is what KRS-One likes to call, you know, some of the elements of hip-hop. But I like to think of it also, again, as a, as a reflection of this culture that is about, again, public space. And if anything, music is a kind of mediation of public space. So the tag, I want to think about that not just as a visual thing, but as an audio thing. You can think of it as the idea of a sample. When you hear a sound, you hear a rhythm or a drum beat or a jazz motif, that's an audio logo. And it's a kind of audio tag. So these kids, what's so beautiful about that is they use the subway as a network. They sent messages. They sent their names going through the system. They were able to transform public space and try and use it in a beautiful way that made it reflect their local environment. So if you were from one neighborhood, you'd be able to see somebody's tag kind of like an encrypted message and be able to read it um, and be able to unpack the meaning out of that. So if you weren't from that area and you didn't know that style, it would be very hard to read. In fact, you'd be illiterate in that style. So these are kinds of different literacy. Now, translate that to sound. What happens when you realize the internet has collapsed all the kinds of geographies we're used to? We're here in Asheville, but there's wireless networks, cell phone relays, satellite systems, uh, GPS units, all of which are linked to all sorts of other networks that make geography become almost irrelevant. You know, I was in Tokyo the other week, and when we were driving in Tokyo, it's a, always a strange experience to see the taxi drivers looking at the GPS um, unit rather than the road. You know, they, they barely pay attention to the road. Um, so that's, that's a very 21st century update, like satellite frequencies everywhere all the time. But that's a different kind of network, and people use that too to get their expression out. Wireless communication, cell phone relays. Imagine what happens when kids start tagging that. So from one network to another, what I want to do tonight is pull you guys out of this idea of urban youth culture as just breakdancing, graffiti, hip-hop, and DJing but to get you to think about it as a broad spectrum thing here. It's not just urban youth culture, it's global culture at this point. So whether you're a b-boy in Tokyo, or a techno kid in Asheville, or a raver in the middle of a rave in London, there's a connection. And that's what I think my book is about, and that's what my music's about, is looking at global digital culture. So these kids, in a certain sense, were giving a gift of expression. And um, as an update of that, what I want to do tonight is get everybody into this idea of thinking about the gift economy. What happens when people trade? So tonight, um, as a special flourish, I burned and made a whole bunch of mixes that I want to give out tonight. Um, can we pass those out? We got a whole bunch. All right. <laughs> and um, so one thing I just want to say is about the gifts, so don't get greedy, you know. <laughs> Uh, just take one and pass one to your neighbor. And what you hopefully everybody will realize is that they got something different. Um, each of the CDs is a different mix and a different version of a lot of different material. Um, one of them is a very special limited edition version I made of a lot of music I've worked with different Indian artists like Talvin Singh or Nitin Sani. Another is electronic music from the Middle East. Um, I got a whole bunch of people from Palestine, Israel, Egypt, Turkey, Iran, Iraq uh, to give electronic music for that mix. Um, I've remixed people's like Yoko Ono or The Doors or The Clash. Um, that's on another mix. So, oh yeah, and if you got the orange one, that's about 40 years of Jamaican music. That's a project I did with Trojan Records. Um, so you have to imagine you're in Kingston, Jamaica around 1967, you know. Um, so with that said and done, um, as we pa pass these out, yeah, uh, they're going to be rotating through the audience and just please take one and pass it on. And just think about the idea of the gift economy, of being able to trade. And I want everybody to leave here tonight with that idea of trade, you know, the gift economy, exchange. All right. 
So tonight, what I want to do is walk you guys through some of the issues that I think about when I look at remix culture. And one of them is this very funny uh, kind of situation that I want to point out. And that's this gentleman. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But what I want to do is, is play you an example of the remix applied to uh, this gentleman. Uh, so with, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, George Bush. During these last few months, I've been trained by Al-Qaeda and I'm weak and materialistic. I told our country and I told the world, if it feels good, do it. I hope you'll enjoy me in expressing fear and selfishness. We will embrace tyranny and death as a cause and a creed. We can be summed up in one word, evil. I am committed to defeating not only the good work of charities, but the values that will bring lasting peace. And we have a great opportunity during this time of war to lead the world towards suicide and murder. Let's roll. All right, so the remix. I think you get the idea, right? There's some memories that we all share that we just want to change a little bit, you know? Um, and I tend to think of that as a reflection of, of the 20th century's kind of main motif for me as an artist was that it was the era of mass production, mass consumerism, mass man, uh, what they call the man in the gray hat, you know, the 1950s character in a flannel suit, everyone dressing the same, and basically, you know, the company man. Um, the 21st century is the era of mass customization, where you're being able to have all this media around you, all these clothes, all these shoes, all these books, uh, the PDF files, Wikipedia, YouTube, and it's not about their version, it's about your version. And what I want to do is think about that from the level of DJ culture, because it's about the first kind of idea of analog remixing versus digital remixing, you know? Grandmaster Flash, Grand Wizard Theodore, um, you know, Carl Craig, a lot of, all sorts of people from the DJ scene. But that was just one area, it's, that's the visual and the audio. I want to kind of, tonight, pull those two together. And what I want to do is um, just use that Bush thing as an example of something that millions of people saw, but everyone walked away with a different version. So, say for example, we have the most televised war in human history, and nobody knows what's going on, right? Um, so, in philosophy, because this is a philosophy lecture, um, <laughs> I think they would call that postmodern. Uh, so, to me, the fun part of looking at that piece is that you have to imagine the idea of a found object, whether it's a presidential speech, or a record, or a data file, it implies that there's a gift going on here where you're transforming and then giving and exchanging. So the remix is a kind of uh, inheritance of what philosophers throughout the ages like to think of as this kind of idea of consciousness because you're looking at something that relates to objects and subjectivity and pulls things from A to B and back again. So there's these kinds of loops and feedback, loops and feedback, loops and feedback, loops and feedback going on. It's not necessarily about the old school method of thinking about art as just a sculpture or just painting, uh, why not upload it, make a PDF file that's downloadable for anybody, put it as a freeware, open source. Um, so tonight, the mixes I gave out to you are open source culture. They're things that I hope everybody will trade. There's very rare material. I collect old 45s that you're making music. Uh, there's the Clash, the remixes, you name it. Um, but I want to update that Bush piece with a friend of mine, or an associate by the name of Danger Mouse, and he had a... <laughs> he had a really funny uh, album where he took 
the, uh, how should I put it, the Beatles, and ran it through, oops, you know what, I didn't upload it yet. I'll have to go through the files here. You guys get a little uh, spooky hard drive here. Um, and basically he took the Beatles and um, mixed them with Jay-Z. So you have the Beatles' white album versus Jay-Z's the black album. So think about that and just remix it and we call it gray. And the Beatles, of course, have some very high octane lawyers and they were able to uh, shut down the website, make sure that his music and materials were erased from the web, uh, cell phones. Keep, you, you can keep them on, right? We can just, right, we'll do a little cell phone symphony in a second. <laughs> um, I, you know, ringtones are DJing too. So basically, I just want to get you to think about what you just saw with the Bush one, and we're going to juggle that and then bring it up to rhythm. So here we go. All I can say is that's a lot more funky than George Bush. But um, the whole idea here is not only is it just a kind of situation where you have uh, people responding to a media environment where they feel a connection and then also have an irreverence for the control mechanisms. It's not a passive situation. As a matter of fact, the remix says, look, I heard that, I saw that, I want to make my own version. So it means that it's a participatory culture. You know, it's not one where you just press play you know, like a previous generation or a couple generations ago. But it's something that we all grew up with now. I mean, we all probably have iPods, I'm sure, or something similar, flash drives and so on. Um, but what that means is essentially that the album, as we knew it in the 20th century, is now the playlist. It's very rare that you like a full album. You probably like maybe one, two tracks on it. You might download it from SoulSeek or Napster or Nutella, or for that matter, LimeWire. But at the end of the day, the culture of what that download means is essentially that the whole physical object of the record of the 20th century of this kind of relationship of 
you know, the record, it's gone. So as a DJ, what I'm looking at is digital media and film. My first film's coming out a little bit, so I've been going through a lot of archives and looking at these older films and seeing how people remix them. So my second book, After Rhythm Science, I have a DVD in the back uh, that's going to have a lot of rare video clips and remixes and stuff like that. My first book, uh, Rhythm Science, has a whole bunch of rare audio recordings of very renowned writers like James Joyce or Gertrude Stein mixed with like Wu-Tang Clan. You know, <laughs> um, you know, stuff like that. But the whole idea is that it's about the mashup. The remix says that there's an irreverence for the normal boundaries between black, white, Asian, Latino, America, Brazil, India, Russia, China. It's a blur. So what everybody growing up in this kind of environment essentially responds to is not about whether it's New York, LA, West Coast, East Coast. That's very, very 20th century. Um, I want to do the update on that and get people to think not only about the American theme of hip hop or drum and bass and techno and all that, but how those things inspire creativity in the everyday world. So from the iPod playlist to Wikipedia, what you're seeing is this shift in individual production. Again, not necessarily mass culture, but mass customization. So behind me you have um, the cover of Scientific American from 1914. It's a very famous image done by Eddie and Jules Murray. He's one of my favorite photographers because he helped popularize this style of photography called stop motion photography. So you essentially have to imagine that the camera's shutter was moving so quick that it would be able to capture movement like, you know, just small slivers. So essentially what you're seeing there is human motion broken into small fragments. So visually speaking, that's the equivalent of a visual sample. So what I want to do is show you a little sample, just a quick thing. Okay, so, <laughs> um, that was, it's nothing. But basic idea is you were hearing tiny fragments of a sound cut up in the same way that you see this photograph here cutting up someone's motion. So stop motion photography becomes stop motion sound. How do you play between the two? That's what I'm going to be focusing on tonight. Behind me you have a gentleman by the name of John Cage. He actually taught at the school that um, this area is so famous for, and that's called the Black Mountain College. Um, he was the first composer to make uh, compositions for turntables, and in 1939 he had a really famous piece called Imaginary Landscape Number no. 1. And the audience was really pissed off when they saw this. Because um, what ended up happening, imagine like an audience like you guys come in, and there's no orchestra, or no DJ at that matter, uh, no orchestra playing, and there was, he just had a whole bunch of record players on stage playing different frequencies. And the audience was like, where's the band? And he's like, well, the frequencies. And so people wanted their money back, everybody was pissed off. And he's like, well, that's the composition. It's the records playing those frequencies, and when you hear them all playing at the same time, hey, it's art, right? Uh, the audience wasn't feeling it. <laughs> but um, the whole idea at that time, 1939, to make a composition out of turntables was a radical step. Because people back then were conditioned to see bands. They needed to see something live. They wanted to see you play or hear you sing. But for us, it's the opposite. We're used to actually pressing play on a record, and then maybe you go see the band. It's very rare that you do the opposite. As a matter of fact, most of our experiences of entertainment and culture are from recordings. So that turns the whole world upside down in terms of how normal human expression over the last several centuries works. Everybody's used to the live. You hear someone speak. Or like that Bush remix, you can edit how someone speaks, 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 speaks. Um, I think he actually sounded more coherent in the remix than, um, <laughs> than in the original, but hey, you know. So the imaginary landscape of the 20th century becomes the digital landscape of the 21st. Analog versus digital. The first composition for turntables in 1939, and here it is 2007, so, for me, it's about data. And the whole pun there is not necessarily about analog versus digital, but about how information evolves in different media. So, this is about a five gigabyte data file. Now, my first film's coming out, and we had to render it and do a whole series of stuff. I got the rights to a very infamous film by D.W. Griffiths called Birth of a Nation. 
Um, and I don't know if anybody out there knows, it's a, it's a very infamous uh, Ku Klux Klan film. Um, and I can assure everybody out there, I'm not a Klan member, you know. Um, but the funny thing is, a lot of the early DJs, uh, people like Grandmaster Flash, Grand Wizard Theodore, uh, they would call themselves that, you know. And I know these guys, and I would say, you know, Flash, by the way, did you know your title's also a Klan title? And he's like, what? Uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, it's a Klan title. You know, you got Grand Masters, Grand Wizards, Grand Dragons. Uh, so the motto there is that, you know, it's one thing to be a Grand Master in Kentucky and another to be a Grand Master in, like, so the South Bronx, you know. Um, but they have the same name, and that's the mashup. So the pun there is that not only is the imaginary landscape of vinyl and CDs, MP3s, Windows Media applications, all of that is about how information moves between structures. So the pun there is that the remix is translation, you know. It means that you are translating what your imagination has done to someone else's work. Is it appropriation? Is it quotation? There's an uneasy tension there between art and artifact. Um, again, going back to that production model, again, the 20th century model, the factory floor there, you know, you can see all the guys working. There was a gentleman by the name of Frederick Winslow Taylor who had this really wild idea of timing everyone's motions. So he called that the clockwork economy. And essentially, he was one of the first people to measure human motion and create a sense of production around it. So how many, you know, people does it take to change a light bulb? Well, he would break it down measure every turn of the screw, uh, how many t steps it would take to go up the ladder, and break each of those into its component parts. So the idea was that all human production models had component elements. So the same thing happens with sampling. You're essentially taking one Lego block and applying it over another. I'm going to just play a collage, just a random thing. Here we go. Whatever going on up there. If you don't, I'm going to call the cops. <laughs>